Why should you care about Ukraine? You should care about Ukraine because this was a country that all they were doing was minding their own business. They were trying to be free. And what you've got is you've got tyrants around the world. I saw this at the United Nations. Russia and China started to get together, not because they like each other, not because they trust each other, but because the one unifying thing for both of them is they want to destroy the West. They want to destroy democracy. They want to destroy freedom. And they're going to do whatever they can to do that. The reason you should care about Ukraine is because if Russia gets away with this, Taiwan is next. And China will take Taiwan. It's not if, it's when. And when they do, Taiwan produces, you know, half of the, the world's semiconductor chips. So for all of your viewers, if you like your phone, if you like your computer, if you like your car, all these things that we now electronically can't live without, China would literally own us. Ukraine just not understand full geopolitics and giving up nukes? I mean, at the end of the day that you have to be uh, responsible for your own security, even if everything was right in the U.S. And, and the world was really trying to do the best they could, that at the end of the day, it still is about you defending yourself. Well, you know, I think Ukraine tried to do the right thing. You know, what they did was in the name of peace, they said, OK, we won't produce, we'll give ours up. Um, but history will now look back. And I think Ukrainians are probably looking back going, should we have done that? And I think now that, you know, the rest of the world's going to look at that. And that's why you're going to see um, all the talks about, you know, denuclearizing are going to be on pause for a good while. So, you know, I'm with you on the, you sort of have to have peace through strength, but there, I do also have a, uh, a strong libertarian side and part of me right now, and I'm hearing this from my audience also, People are just kind of like, you know, we're so screwed up in this country right now. All the woke stuff and critical race theory and the border and inflation and supply chain. And of course, we can relate some of that back to the energy, which gets us to Russia. But that there's just so many problems right now. It's like, can't someone else do something right now? And I am somewhat sympathetic to that, even hearing the arguments like there is part of me that's just like maybe there's just too much to chew off right now, especially because I just don't have faith in our leaders right now. If we had leaders that I had faith in, maybe I would feel a little bit differently. Well, you know, I've always had a libertarian streak to me too. And I think that, you know, government needs to stay out of a lot of things and we would be much better off. But what I will tell you is we always have to fight for freedom. And the reason we fight for freedom is because it could, you know, the threats could end up on our doorstep. Why should you care about Ukraine? You should care about Ukraine because this was a country that all they were doing was minding their own business. They were trying to be free. And what you've got is you've got tyrants around the world. I saw this at the United Nations. Russia and China started to get together, not because they like each other, not because they trust each other, but because the one unifying thing for both of them is they want to destroy the West. They want to destroy democracy. They want to destroy freedom. And they're going to do whatever they can to do that. The reason you should care about Ukraine is because if Russia gets away with this, Taiwan is next. And China will take Taiwan. It's not if, it's when. And when they do, Taiwan produces, you know, half of the, the world's semiconductor chips. So for all of your viewers, if you like your phone, if you like your computer, if you like your car, all these things that we now electronically can't live without, China would literally own us. We would be in the same situa situation that Europe is with Russia on the dependency of, of energy, we would be in that same dependency with China. And China would not be near as kind as Russia, I can promise you that. They're stronger, they're sleeker, they're smarter, and they're more determined than ever to ruin the West. And so these are all places we have to care about because if, if it's another country, it could be us. And we're not saying go to war. I'll be the first one to say, as a wife of a combat veteran, that's a last resort. What I am saying is use the power of our voice for good. Use the fact that we do have military arms that we can send for good. Use the fact that we can help get our allies together to become less dependent on Russia so they don't put all of us in a bad situation so that we can really get more alliances together. That's all for good. That's not, you know, that's not going to war. That's not getting government involved. That's saying we're going to protect freedom and we have to protect freedom wherever it rains. 
How much of this do you blame on the Biden administration? I mean, you were uh, at the UN under President Trump. You know, it's not that we had perfect world peace, obviously, but Putin was quiet when it came to Ukraine. He did some stuff, Crimea under Obama, uh, but there was certainly the feeling that if he did something under Trump, who obviously was like, well, what would Trump do? So he didn't do any, you know, so Putin ma didn't make a move. How much of this do you blame on, on Biden? You mentioned Keystone Pipeline. I mean, we're, we're reliant on the bad guys. This is a problem. Biden is has really, really done this to all of us. And I will tell you, this never would have happened under President Trump. Um, and it was because President Trump really kind of laid it out there for all the tyrants out there. But President Trump did something that Russia absolutely disliked. He built up our military, which Russia never wanted us to do. He made sure we were energy independent, which Russia didn't like. And he made sure that he um, would not allow Nord Stream 2 to go through, which was going to be a big revenue source um, for Russia. But what's happened since then? President Biden now comes into office. He allows Afghanistan to fall. But not only did Afghanistan fall, what they saw was the United States left Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling the allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for two decades without telling them that we were doing it. Big signal to our enemies, big signal to our allies. Then you go forward and he goes and waves Nord Stream 2, a gift to Putin at a time that he needed it. Then you add on to that, Biden's falling all over himself to get into the Iran deal. I mean, that the weakness of that, when Iran wouldn't even let the US in the room, Biden's begging to get back into a deal with the number one state sponsor of terror. And then finally, you see Biden speak. And what does he say? He says, well, if it's a minor incursion, we'll do one thing. If it's an invasion, we'll do another. Those were all green lights for Putin. Putin knew that never again would we have a weak president like this in America. And it's the same thing President Xi sees in China. They see it. They know there's an opportunity. Putin chose to move on it. It never would have happened under President Trump because there was never any weakness. There was deterrence under President Trump. Do you think Putin's a little surprised that it seems like the whole world has rallied around this? I mean, you know, they're talking about kicking him off the SWIFT system and the sanctioning of the oligarchs and all of this stuff. I, I don't know that it's going to work exactly, but do you think he's a little surprised how quickly things came to be? Although they did, Russia did veto they're a Security Council member, so they vetoed the UN Security Council resolution, which is sort of hilarious, I suppose, in a depressing sense. I, mean, I think he's completely taken aback. I mean, I don't think that he thought that, um, you know, that he was going to see this much resistance. I don't think he thought that President Zelensky would become this much of a hero. Um, I don't think he knew the courage and inspiration um, that the Ukrainian people would be to the world. And so, you know, what you've got is, Ukrainians picking up knives from their kitchens if they have to. They're, you know, standing up in front of tanks. They're, you know, picking up guns from anywhere and they're fighting back for their freedom and fighting back for their country. We should take a lesson from them on how much they are doing to protect being free, how precious being free actually is. And so I think Putin's absolutely taken back. And I think she sees Putin as sloppy. I think that he's he's looking at how Putin did this and he's looking at Putin made mistakes, but the way President Xi is looking at this is he's very much paying attention to every country that's giving Ukraine arms. He's paying attention to every company that's no longer doing business with Russia. He's watching what's happening at the UN. He's watching how the world is isolating Russia. And he's not saying, no, I'm not going to do this. He's saying, OK, when I do this, I'm going to have to do it differently. And so, it, again, we can't take our eyes off of China because China is going to be next. What we need to do is learn the lessons of Russia and see what happens when division comes in, which is what happened with us and our allies. When we look distracted, it opens a door for these thugs to do, um, you know, the devil's work. And that's exactly what they're doing. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.